All right, I think we're ready. This is the last one of these we're gonna do for the Shigley book, uh, this year anyway. I guess we'll do some next year. Um, what we're talking about today is in chapter 16, and it is, um, chapter 16 is actually, let's get the whole title for it. Um, it's more than what we're gonna talk about today, uh, but in general, it's friction elements. So let's see, the actual title is clutches, brakes, couplings, and flywheels. We're gonna look at a piece of brakes. Um, these, in general, have to do with uh, friction materials. Um, I guess the flywheels don't necessarily, but the others do. We're gonna spend our time here today pretty much looking at just the brake part, and then of the brakes, there's different types of brakes, uh, we're gonna look at drum brakes. Uh, because they're the probably the ones that are harder to just figure out what's going on. The the disc brakes and other things like that, and the clutches are very similar to disc brakes. Uh, they are pretty clear on how they work, um, and the book does a good job of describing that. And we only have time to do one thing, so we're going to do drum brakes. Um, so what I've got here are some 3D printed parts to kind of represent a drum brake. First, let's look at what one in the real world looks like more like. Uh, here I've got a picture. Now this one is very stripped down. There's not a lot going on in this picture, um, but that's on purpose so that we don't get too confused about what's going on. Um, these pieces on the edge, the kind of, I don't know, greenish gray color, uh, those are uh, the pads. So over here on my little model, over here the, the shaded in gray parts are the pads. Um, these are the surfaces that they do wear down. Um, they're made of a friction material that is uh, resistant to heat because they're going to generate a lot of heat uh, trying to stop whatever is rotating. Um, but they're the part that actually makes contact with the drum. Um, this picture doesn't show the drum, and I don't really have a drum printed. I have the part of a drum, you know, this, this cup part, um, where the inside surface is where these pads are going to uh, rub against whenever you're trying to stop the drum from rotating. So other parts of this are uh, the cylinder here. Um, in this case, they've got two brake shoes. So one shoe on the back and one shoe on the front or the left and the right or, you know, whichever orientation you want to think of here. Um, and they're both connected to this cylinder in the middle. So this is a hydraulic cylinder, has brake fluid in it. Um, when you press the gas, oh, not the gas, when you press the brake pedal, um, uh, fluid will be uh, forced into this chamber, and inside this chamber are two little pistons that will move outward, and they actuate the uh, brake shoes, and so they push them apart. In my little model, I don't have a cylinder. I have this little cam type thing that I can turn and uh, push the brake pads apart. Um, and then the other piece of this one, there's some sort of return mechanism. So this one has a spring across it. I have sort of this kind of spring right here, just kind of representing it. All of this stuff is 3D printed, so it's kind of um, generalized to be able to, first of all, be 3D printed and then kind of serve the same functions as what we see on the screen here. There can be a lot of other parts like automatic adjustments. Um, there can be a lot more springs going on inside here. These little springs right here, here and here, those are used to kind of hold the brake shoes themselves in place um, from you know moving too far forwards or backwards into the screen or out of the screen in our picture. <clears throat> but that's the general idea. And so the general thing is that there's a drum, not shown here, that's spinning around and it's connected to whatever machine you're moving. So it's the uh, connected to the wheel of a car, it's connected to some kind of drive system of a machine um, and, and that's spinning around. All of the stuff on the screen here is stationary. At least it's, uh, it's not rotating. Um, and then when you want to stop the drum from rotating, you apply a force, in this case from this cylinder, to the top of the brake shoes. They pivot down at the bottom. So there's two little pivot points down here. And um, they expand, you know, outwards. I guess the brake shoe doesn't expand, but their position moves so that they come in contact with the rotating drum. And the friction between this brake pad and the drum is eventually enough to stop the drum from rotating. 
So let's kind of go back to our model here. It's all kind of dark and hard to see, but um, this is representing our drum. So let's kind of move it down here. So it, it would be the spin, <coughs> spinning part. Now, most of the time in, in this kind of setup, uh, the drum is actually more like this, where it's the, uh, you know, it's right behind the wheel and the wheel is bolted to all of this stuff. And uh, this is just a little spacer in here. Then we've got a couple of, I don't remember which order they go on. I think it's this way. Brake shoe and brake shoe. And then, now my 3D printed spring may not work very well, but we will, yeah, it's not gonna work very well, but we'll, we'll make it work. And then our little cam here is the actuator. So the idea would be I have to, right now all of this could spin. So this is, normally these parts do not spin. They stay stationary. So I kind of have to hold them stationary and hold the spring in place. Um, and so the drum is out there spinning. And when you want to stop, then some force is going to actuate against, and like I said, my spring is not wanting to cooperate. Let's just get it out of there. Um, some force is going to actuate to push these pads against the drum and then it, it won't rotate like this whole thing shouldn't rotate at all um, and then there's enough friction between here and here uh, to keep the drum from rotating or to stop it from rotating and then when you remove the force the return mechanism in this case my little spring uh, pulls the shoes in and now you're free for the drum to rotate again so that's the general idea and um, you can have a lot of different configurations of this. Uh, you can have internal shoes like we have here. You can actually have external shoes where the shoe uh, is on the outside of the drum and presses against it from the outside. Um, that's not as common, but you could, you could have that. Um, you don't have to have two shoes in here. You could have just one. You know, you don't need the other one. One of these shoes is going to do more work than the other one, depending on which way the drum is rotating. So is it rotating this way or is it rotating this way? And depending on which way it's rotating, one of these shoes, when you have two like this, one of them will be um, called self-energizing. And we'll look at that in a second, what it means. But in general, uh, you could kind of get a picture of it. Um, if we rotate, in this case, clockwise, and I start to apply pressure, um, I don't know if you'll be able to pick up on it or not because you can't feel any of this stuff. But the self-energizing shoe would be this one. And what happens is it actually, as it starts to make contact, it actually gets grabbed by the drum and pulled even harder against the drum. Whereas the other shoe, like if we're going this way, you know, we're rotating clockwise. When I actuate it, it actually gets pushed away from the drum. And so it's, it's de-energizing or self-de-energizing. -de um, so one of them actually gets pulled into the drum and actually pushes harder. Uh, and the other one kind of has to work against the drum. Uh, and we'll look at the actual forces that cause that self-energizing and de-energizing in a second. Um, actually, we'll look at the self-energizing. In our model, we're just going to look at one shoe. And I'm not going to draw the other one because we have to draw a lot of stuff on here. And it gets really cluttery um, when you put both shoes on the same diagram and try to draw everything on top of it. Um, all right, let's define some variables. So let's look first of all at what your book shows for um, these images. So this is the kind of thing that your book has in it. Um, and you can kind of see the rim rotation. That's what I've been calling the drum. Um, there's the, the shoe itself. They have a shorter shoe than what we were having here on our model in our picture. Um, there's the pad, that gray stripe across there. They've got some letters here, A and R. There's F. Um, got some D thetas in there that we'll have to see what that means. Um, here, there's a little bit more geometry. This one is really cluttery, but it might be the one that's most useful. Um, so here, now again, they've rotated things around. So their pin for the drum, you know, I've got mine pinned down here. It's turned sideways, horizontal. Um, that's typically when you look at a drum brake on a car, they're not that orientation. 
Um, but they've done that so that they have this horizontal axis lined up with a particular measurement on here. Uh, the A is kind of buried in here. Um, we're gonna kind of build this diagram up from uh, from scratch so that we can kind of see what everything is doing. Because um, there is a lot going on here when you try to look at it. So let's build this um, on here. All right, so first of all, we need a center of rotation, you know, where is our shoe? Where is it pinned at? So I'm gonna pin down here. So that's gonna be the pin where um, this thing pivots around, around that point. Okay, um, that will let us set a variable called A, and we're gonna use, we use blue for our dimensions. So this distance here is A. And that e distance will be in our equations uh, several times. Uh, and all it is is the distance from the center of the hole, from the, basically the drum or the rim, your book uses the word rim, um, from that center to the point where the uh, shoe pivots. So that's, that's that one. Um, we have a force F Here, that's the force that is applied um, from, in our case, for our example here, it was this little cam pushing outwards. Um, in the case of the um, drum that we had a picture of, it's the force from this uh, brake cylinder. Now, on this thing and on our example, a lot of times the way that this force is applied, uh, when you have two shoes, is that it's applied equally to both of the shoes. So in this case, there's hydraulic fluid in here uh, and it's you know pushing pistons outward and both the, the front shoe and the back shoe get the same F. So we're just not drawing this half over here, but it would also have this same value of force. And that'll become important later on when we're trying to figure out what this other shoe is doing. All right. Um, we have R. That's a that's a simple enough one. That is, I'll just put it kind of. I'll just put it over here. The inner radius of the drum or the rim. That's R. So basically, where all this friction is happening, the surface that it's happening on. That's R. Um, we have um, what's another one that we have? We have C. That one is going to get kind of cluttery but let's let's go ahead and draw it it's this distance here so that is C where the top measurement is where is that force F applied you know here and the bottom you're measuring two is where that pin is so the distance from that pin to that force F is C so basically it's the moment arm if you think about this force creating a moment about this pin, it's the moment arm for that force about that pin. Um, we need some thetas now. All right, so first of all, theta um, here is theta equals zero degrees. So that's kind of our reference. That's also sort of why your book turns that axis where the pin is, turns it horizontal because that's theta equals zero. So that's gonna be the oddness about how we're drawing here is that theta equals zero on this, this line here. Um, now, theta one and theta two, and there's a theta a. We'll get to theta a in a second, but theta one and theta two. Um, let's start with actually theta two. Theta two is going to be if we were to take and draw from the center to wherever now I haven't drawn the friction material in here yet um, but wherever that friction material ends measured from our theta zero so this angle here that's theta two we're going to say that theta two in our case is going to equal 120 degrees so this angle from here to theta two is 120 degrees. I got kind of covered up. 
there we go. Um, theta one, so theta two is where does the friction material end? Theta one is where does it start? And we're gonna make our friction material start maybe like right there. We're gonna make this theta one and it equals 20 degrees and it's you know this measure. So our friction material doesn't necessarily cover the entire uh, the entire surface. Now in this one, it I, the, the little model I made here, um, or printed, I didn't make it the model, I printed it. Um, it does cover the entire surface, but that's not always the case. Um, it could be that the friction material, the brake pad, um, only covers you know some sec sector of this circle. Um, so in our case, we're going to have the pad cover from here you know down to here and then there's no there's no brake pad material down here the shoes keeps going but the pad is not there and so here is our friction material and this material is the material that actually gets pushed against the drum and creates the friction to stop the drum from rotating and so theta 1 and theta 2 reference the theta zero which is uh, at the pin and it tells where does the friction material start and where does it end and then there is also a theta a and theta a is you might could imagine if i've if i'm pivoted here pushing here this this drum doesn't really press evenly against the side like i don't have an even stress distribution across here um, in fact, I have sort of a, a sine wave shape um, where the maximum stress, something like this, if I were to draw the stress profile, you know, I've got this maximum stress somewhere over here. Theta A is where that maximum stress occurs. And for what's called a long shoe, where the friction surface is long, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more specific about long and short in a second, but for now, where you've got this long coverage of green friction material in our case here, um, you have a long shoe and that theta A is 90 degrees. So if I were to measure 90 degrees from here, you know, something like that, that looks like 90 degrees maybe, that is theta A and it equals 90 degrees. So I've got a 90 degree angle right here. Um, and that is also the location of what we're gonna call PA, the maximum pressure. And then everywhere else, I've got a smaller and smaller pressure on the um, surface of the now this, these lines should probably be coming off normal uh, now that I think about it. Something like that. So I've got this pressure distribution and it maxes out in our case with the long shoe, it maxes out at 90 degrees. Now it's possible that you have a short shoe where you don't, uh, the, the coverage of the pad, the what I've drawn in green, do, is, doesn't exist at 90 degrees. And so in that case, theta A just becomes wherever the maximum pressure is. So maybe if you just have a shoe that's that's really short, then that maximum, that is theta A. So if you just had a really short shoe, then that part would be theta A. Um, and Or if you had a short shoe down here, then here's your maximum pressure. But when you have a long shoe that has at least 90 degrees of coverage of the pad material measured from that reference point, then you have a long shoe and theta A is 90 degrees and that's where your maximum pressure between the shoe material and the drum exists. All right. Um, I think that's what I want to draw now. And then let's go and we're going to have to put some more things on here now that I think about having you know, drawing this on here, we're gonna kind of have to draw on top of that, but that's okay. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So let's let's go to MathCAD and calculate some stuff. 
So here we are in MATCAD. Let's put in our variables that we have. Um, some of them we're just going to have to define. Now we're not modeling exactly what I've printed here. Um, it's that style, but the dimensions are going to be more realistic. So let's model B at 2.5 inches. Now we didn't talk about B. B is the face width. So in our deal here, B is this dimension. You know, how wide is the shoe? So we did, I couldn't draw that on our picture because it's into the page. So we're just going to set that at two and a half inches wide. That's a realistic number for an automobile. Anyway, um, R is five inches. That's probably on the larger size for a drum. Uh, these drums aren't necessarily 10 inch diameter drums. Um, but you could have one that large. We're, that's what we're going to use is R. So remember, that's the distance from the center of everything to the inner surface of the drum. A uh, is four inches. This is, um, remember, the distance from the pin to the uh, center of everything. That's four inches for us. We do have a long shoe, so theta A is 90 degrees. Again, if you have a short shoe and it doesn't cover not that 90 degree point, then it's just going to be how close to 90 does it cover? And that'll be your theta A. <clears throat> um, C. We didn't, we have to calculate C. So let's go over here. C is this distance. I don't have that directly labeled on here. But I do have a couple of things that will help us calculate C. So I know that um, A is four inches, and I'm looking at this triangle right here. So let's 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 extract this triangle maybe over here. So A is here. That's four inches. I don't know this distance. I want to know this distance because this times two is C. Now it's not always true that your shoe is a symmetric like this where the distance from where you apply the force <clears throat> to where it rotates is uh, half of it here and half of it here. Um, it could be that the force is much lower or you know it could be asymmetric somehow. Um, in, in this one that I have created I made it symmetric. However yours is you have to come up with the distance the moment arm from this force to the point of rotation for the shoe. Um, and so for us, that's just two of these distances. <clears throat> this angle um, I've got from here to here is 120. And I'm also going to assume that this is centered. It's not shifted up or down. So that leaves um, 30 degrees for this angle. So some of these you would need to be given. Some you would have to have enough information to determine that this is 30 degrees. And once you know that, you have four, you have 30, you want to know this, you just do a cosine. Cosine of 30 degrees equals, um, let's call that y. And, what, and c will be two times y. y over four inches. Therefore, y equals, um, I don't know, cosine, I guess I could put that in MathCAD, but we'll just do it on a calculator. Cosine of 30 times four is 3.5. Four, six and then C is two times Y equals six point nine two eight. That number we'll put in MathCat. All right. So C equals six point nine two eight inches. All right, at this point I believe we almost have everything. Um, so there's two ways we might go about doing this. One is, do we know how much force we're going to apply and uh, calculate everything based on that? Another is, do we know how much pressure our pad can take and calculate our force and our stopping torque based on that? We're going to do the second of these where we're going to figure out what is our maximum, assuming we can apply any amount of force that we want to, what is our maximum stopping torque based on the material that we're using? So in order to do that, 
we need to know how much maximum pressure it can handle. And we have a chart. We always have a chart. Let me find the chart. We may have to get it out of the book if I don't have a PowerPoint of it. I'm looking to see if I do. Um, I may not have. Oh, wait, wait. Here we go. Yes. Characteristics of friction material. So table 16.3. Um, now, I might know the material over here on the left column, and I could work that way. On the right-hand column, I've got application, so brakes and clutches, drum brakes is right here. So why don't we use the drum brake since that is a application. We can get two pieces of information off of this chart. We can get the friction coefficient um, for rigid molded asbestos dry. Um, and it ranges from 0.35 to 0.41. So we can get that number in a second. Um, and then here's the maximum allowable pressure on that material. And it's 100 PSI. So you can see some with much higher, you know, maximum pressures. None with the lower maximum pressures, though. So this is kind of the, the, the worst one we can use as far as uh, maximum pressure. But it's pretty good on the friction. Some of these, like 0.06 but we're at 0.35 at the low end. So it's, it's a good, and the other really good part about this uh, asbestos is that it can handle some pretty high temperatures. Um, some of these others can handle higher temperatures, but uh, it will handle those higher temperatures. All right, so we're gonna take the fact that the material that we're using can handle 100 PSI of pressure, maximum pressure, and we're gonna put that on our, I guess I need that back, um, material properties here. So we will use PA and set that to 100 PSI. And while we're here, let's go ahead and make the friction um, 0 0.35. We had an option of a range from 0.35 to 0.41. Um, and so typically when I have a range, I want to take the most conservative approach in most cases. Um, and so in this case, the friction coefficient is um, more conservative when I pick the slippier, more slippy, slippery, more slippery material property. Um, so I'm going to take the 0.35. So that's still actually really grabby and not very slippery. But um, I don't want to put the 0.41 uh, just because that's less conservative. So I'm going to do the 0.35. But there is a range here and you might have a reason to pick the higher end of the range or the average of the range or whatever. We're going to pick the 0.35 because it's the least uh, likely to stop the drum. And so that'll be the most conservative uh, approach I can take. So here, I believe we have all of the inputs. Well, no, we need theta 1 and theta 2. So let's go ahead and put those in. Let's kind of move this up so it can all be kind of beside the picture. And let's put them with the theta A. All right, so theta one is where, in reference to the pin, does the pad start? And I said on our diagram, I said that was 20 degrees. So in reference to this datum, how many degrees before the pad material, not the shoe, but the actual friction material, and I set that at 20 degrees. And then theta 2 is, where does it end? I set that at 120 degrees. All right, now we have all of the, the geometry defined here. We have the material. Um, we have two material properties. We have the friction coefficient for it, and we have its maximum allowable pressure. And what we can do now is we can start calculating the stopping torque. So this is where it'll probably help us to label some more things on here. Um, <clears throat> we need to label where is the friction occurring. Now it's occurring all across the uh, surface of the pad. And that's why we have the theta 1 and theta 2. And that's why this picture, well, that one doesn't show it. Which one shows it? This one. This picture shows a d theta 
we're going to end up integrating across that entire surface of the pad. Um, what we're going to integrate are, we're, we're looking at these two forces right now. Then they, They've broken them into kind of X and Y components. Um, but we're going to just look at the normal force and the frictional force. So let's put those on here. Um, I think I'll try and draw them with a bigger marker so maybe they stand out. Um, first, we need to know which way is the drum rotating. So let's make the drum rotate this way. <clears throat> which will and, and these forces are the forces acting on the pad. So um, when the pad is pushed against the drum, then the drum pushes back on it. And we're going to have a normal force pushing on the pad. In fact, let's, let's make it push on the pad there. So that guy is the normal force. I may have to move my paper here in a second. There we go. And the drum is rotating this way, so it's creating a frictional force that's tangent here. So that, that guy is the frictional force. Now those might be a little hard to, to see on top of everything else, but <clears throat> those two we're going to take every point from theta equals 20 degrees to theta equals 120 degrees and integrate those two across here. Um, but what we're going to integrate is actually the moment that they create. And so remember I talked about um, this idea of self-energizing and um, self-de-energizing or just de-energizing. And that comes into what is this frictional force doing? Is the frictional force helping to... Um, create more stopping torque or is it hurting that? So if we take moments about, and let's just take these two forces, not the whole, let's not think about the whole pressure distribution, but let's just think about these two instances. Um, these are at the maximum, but uh, we could have put them anywhere. And the force that's causing everything to begin with, so this force. And let's sum moments about the pin where the, the pad is pivoting. So if I do moments around here, then I will have, let's see, let me write it up here. Moment about pin. I would have F times C, right? F times C. That's just the force. Um, that is, or the moment that's created by this force pushing at the top of the uh, pad. And then I've got this normal force and, you know, it has some moment arm. And now the, the way, when I've drawn uh, sigma A, then that no moment arm is just A. So that makes it kind of simple. So, um, and that's going the, op that's opposing this force, right? So this one's making a clockwise moment. This one's making a counterclockwise moment. So I would have, uh, let's just call it Fn for normal times A. And then the frictional force in this case is actually creating the same sense moment that this applied force is. And so it has uh, the R is its moment arm. So the frictional force times R, but it's actually clockwise so it's actually a minus sign over here now your book uses an mn to represent this term and it uses uh, mf to represent the frictional one um, and then it uses uh just what does it use to represent this just t i think maybe just t so the, the torque that it can stop with. I think it uses that. I'd, I'd have to look it up and see exactly what it uses to represent that. Um, actually, no, it doesn't do that. What it does is it keeps the torque separate and it uses F and moves the C over here. That's what it does. Um, and at some point, it's going to combine those together to create the torque. But uh, in this equation, it actually has the F and C separated. Sorry about that little... I don't like scratching out stuff. <clears throat> All right. So here we've got 
um, the, the idea of the self-energizing shoe. Where the frictional force is actually helping the uh, applied force. If we were to draw the same thing over here, um, you know, the, if, if this shoe was mirrored over on this side, then we would have a uh, normal force steel. And uh, we would have that friction. Now it's going this way. And we'd have some kind of pin over here. The force that's acting on the shoe would go this way. And uh, the moment created by the uh, applied force is counterclockwise. And the moment created by both the normal and the frictional force are clockwise. So it's not helping create more, more um, pressure against the drum. And so this side with this sort of rotation would be a de-energizing shoe when that frictional force doesn't help. Um, in fact, it kind of, you know, it wants to push the, the shoe back away where this, this force wants to grab the shoe and bring it into the drum even harder. All right, now we've got all of the possible things. Let's go put some equations together. Um, these equations are um, 16.3 and 16.2. See if I can find them in here. Here they are. Um, and so there's the 16-2 equation uh, for the moment created by the frictional force. And here, whoa, didn't want to move it out of the way. Here's the 16-3 equation, the moment created by the normal force. I'm going to use the, um, you know, the, both of these integrals would work. This is the indefinite one, though. So we're going to use the definite integral that uh, has these boundaries from theta 1 to theta 2. So basically, we're going to take this, this force and integrate um, the normal force and frictional force from theta 1 all the way around to theta 2. So let's put these equations into MathCAD. So let's do which one first? Um, I have 16.3 first. And it says uh, the moment created by the normal force about the pin of the shoe is equal to um, F, so that friction coefficient, times PA. We have set PA to the 100 PSI maximum, um, but if you knew the force, then you could figure out, you could, you could be solving for the PA. So if I knew how much force I was applying, I could solve for PA um, and do more of a uh, design that direction versus having um, infinite force available and figuring out what's our maximum stopping power. So you could do it the other way. Face width, um, R, got to make sure I'm doing this, PA. Oh, wait, I'm doing the wrong equation. We, uh, the normal force doesn't need the friction coefficient, does it? That kind of doesn't make sense. So just PA, B. Um, internal radius a the distance from the pin to the center of the drum over all of that over sine of theta a so in our case theta a is 90 degrees um, where the maximum pressure is and this times the um, gotta remember how to nope I think it's control shift it's not that Control shift I, oh, for integral. Um, from theta one, whoops, I thought that would get me over here, to theta two, uh, d theta. And then we're integrating for the moment created by the normal force, we're integrating sine squared of theta sine of theta squared, no, a sine squared of theta. And we should be able to evaluate that. Uh, let's put it in foot pounds though. Oh, it doesn't like an underline there. 520.8 foot pounds um, total when we integrate the entire surface of the pad. Um, now, the frictional force creates a moment also, 
and that one is f because we need the friction coefficient now and pa um, b this is equation 16 2 by the way i'll type that in in a second over sine of theta a no wait doing the parentheses wrong And all of that times, again, from theta 1 to theta 2. D theta. And this time we're integrating um, sine of theta times, all of that times, um, r minus a times cosine of theta d theta let's put that in foot pounds and it's another 216 <coughs> and um we so that those are the two moments uh created uh, the moment created by the normal force across the entire surface of the pad and the moment created by the uh, frictional force across the entire surface of the pad. Um, we could um, also use equation 16.6, um, which will calculate the braking torque for a self-energizing shoe. Um, so let's use, oh, well, I said I was going to write down the equation number for this one. This is equation 16.2. So we needed that. Um, equation 16.6 might be something more useful. And that is, it will calculate the braking torque. I'm calling it T1 um, because we will have two different ones. We'll have the braking torque from the self-energizing shoe, and then we'll have a smaller amount of contribution from the de-energizing shoe. So this will be T1 will be the self-energizing shoe. And it is equation 16.6. Um, and it equals the friction times PA times B times R squared over sine of theta A times uh, the integral from theta 1. Uh, I wish tab would not tab the whole thing theta 2 d theta and we integrate um, sine of theta and put that in foot pounds also so 262 foot pounds of stopping torque from the energy self energizing shoe now we can't really do the same thing um, for the de-energizing shoe um, so we don't have an equation like this like it's equation 16 7 that uh, tells us the same thing for the de-energizing shoe um, in fact I'm trying to see what is the next equation um, well oh and also in here um, they do have some of the integrals evaluated for you so that you don't have to integrate them um, in the book. Some of the integrals are already evaluated for you. I forgot about that. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we know a couple of things. We know that the de-energizing shoe is not creating as much uh, stopping torque as the self-energizing shoe because the friction is not helping it to grab into the drum uh, so we know there's some um, ratio that of the uh, de-energizing shoe to the self-energizing shoe that is less than one and we want to figure out what that ratio is and then we can take and say well if I know that ratio then I know how much of what percentage basically of this 262 foot-pounds is the uh, de-energizing shoe contributing to stopping the wheel or the drum.
So let's go into our, basically this equation here that we derived and let's put that in here. So F equals M N minus M F over C. So this is the equation that we generated when we did the summation of moments about the pin for the self energizing shoe. And, um, the, the thing about this is that we do know this F is the same force applied to the self-energizing shoe that would be applied to the de-energizing shoe. Um, so we do know that that F is the same on both of them um, because of the way that these work, whether it's, you know, the little cam that's, you know, pushing equally against both sides or the little brake cylinder, hydraulic cylinder that's pushing those pistons out um, in opposite directions with the same amount of force on each one of them. We know that that force F is the same. So that helps us. Um, and we can calculate that force because we know MN, we just calculated it up here. We know MF, we calculated it right here. And we know C. That was the distance from the force to the pin. Uh, and let's put it in pound force. So 527 pounds. Now we know how much force is being applied to the uh, both shoes, either one. Um, we have a similar to this equation for the de-energizing shoe. We didn't actually write it out. We drew kind of, we walked through the talking of it with this force, this frictional force, this normal force, frictional force, um, the applied force and the pin that we would sum moments around it would generate almost an identical equation, except there is a plus sign here. When, because the normal force and frictional force are both going in the same direction when they create a moment. So we can also write, and I'm gonna write this not as, I'm gonna write it as a symbolic equals um, because I don't want to redefine F, I just wanna write this equation down. Mn plus Mf over C. So this is the D energizing shoe and this one is the self energizing shoe okay now that we have that we can um, write us another equation to sub in a couple of things so let's go down here let's write F and I'm going to write this one symbolically also Instead of um, Mn, because we don't know, in fact, I should probably put um, some other subscript on here. Let's just do a two or something, because this normal force and frictional force are the other normal and frictional force. They're not the same value that we had here. These are the ones on the de-energizing shoe. So they do have different values. Um, so, But instead of putting those in to begin with, what I'm going to do is that I know that they are some percentage of the self-energizing shoe. So I'm going to put the self-energizing shoe value in here. And I'm going to multiply it times uh, this percentage. And I'm going to make up the percentage PA2. I'll call it PA2. Uh, use the subscript. So this is the maximum pressure on the other shoe, on the de-energizing shoe over p a that was the 100 psi of the maximum pressure of the self-energizing shoe so this p a 2 over p a is just the ratio um, of the de-energizing maximum pressure to the self-energizing maximum pressure and i know this m n is the moment created by the normal force on the self-energizing shoe so all i'm doing here is saying that i know that the Mn, the normal moment created by the other shoe, the de-energizing shoe, is just some percentage, PA2 over PA, of the self-energizing shoe. And I will do the same thing with the frictional force. Oops, needed to do a uh, divided. Well, I think I used lowercase p, though. And then the rest of that is over C. C does not change. Okay. So 
I know everything in here. I know F because the same force is applied to both shoes. The same external force is applied to both of them. C did not change. They, they're symmetric shoes. So now some things could, you know, you could have uh, one size shoe over here and a different size over here. And then C is different. They could have different pin locations. In general, they don't, but you could have those things. Um, in, in our case, everything's symmetric. So this side looks just like this side, just mirrored. So we know C. Um, we know PA, the maximum pressure, because we just said that it's going to be the maximum pressure the material can ha handle, 100 PSI. We calculated the MN and MF, and that only leaves... Wow, well, if I could get it to... Let's type it all in the same... There we go. Um, that only leaves this PA2 unknown in this equation. And I can solve for that. So uh, solving for PA2... I end up with, if you solve this equation, you get um, PA, keep wanting to make it capital, but I don't think I use capital everywhere else, times F, so whatever that applied force is, which we just solved for somewhere, 527, um, times C over M the original uh, or the self energizing MN plus MF. And we should be able to solve that, put it in PSI. And so 41 PSI. So this makes sense in the sense that originally we had the uh, self energizing shoe. We set it at this material, the asbestos on the surface here can take 100 PSI. The de-energizing shoe uh, takes some percentage less of that. We figured out the percentage and it turned out to be 41 PSI, which makes sense, it is less. Oh, thanks, got some comments. Um, and now we can take this same equation, in fact, I'm gonna copy it, and paste this, replace this with a two. Well, let's make it a subscript two just to have all of them the same. And put our PA two in here. Everything else stays the same. So we haven't changed the face width. We haven't changed the diameter of the drum. We haven't changed the friction coefficient of the material. Um, we're, it's the same coverage. So 20 degrees to 120 degree, uh, degrees. And everything else is the same. Same pressure, maximum pressure angle and we get 108. So our total stopping torque is just, you add these two together. And let's put it in foot pounds since we did everything else in that unit. 370.9 foot pounds of total stopping torque from the uh, self-energizing shoe and the de-energizing shoe. Um, at that point, you would probably have solved everything that you need to solve. There is the option, and your book has these equations. Um, you can check the pin reactions, so make sure you don't shear this pin off. Um, and those are equations 16.9 um, and 16.10 in your book. Uh, and they give you basically an RX and RY uh, shear forces on this pin so that you don't undersize the pin. Uh, that's the rest of the drum equations. I don't think we need to really go through those. They're really just plug and play with variables that we already have. Um, and so it's not a, not a great leap to go calculate the Rx and Ry. Actually, the easier ones might be equation F and G um, to solve those. They have several different ways that you can solve Rx and Ry, um, depending on if you've got clockwise rotation or counterclockwise rotation or, or what, you, what have you. Um, but there are equations to calculate the pin reaction so that you don't undersize that pin right there. Okay. Um, that, you know, we, we didn't spend the entire hour and 15 minutes doing this, but we spent pretty close to it. We don't have time to start another type of friction element. Um, so that'll be the last thing that we do for the uh, Shigley, second half of Shigley textbook anyway. There are other pieces in the book uh, that uh, you could reference like this chapter does have clutches um, 
which this style clutch, the one I just pointed to, if I can find it again, this style clutch does work similar to a drum brake because it's basically the same type of thing except these little um, pads spring outward um, at certain rotations. So at certain RPM of the of this one does spin, it will fling these clutches out and grab the the drum here and engage it. Um, the other parts that are in here are pretty straightforward, I think, um, because there's an external shoe. It works similar to the internal shoe, except the forces are coming from the outside pushing on the drum or the cylinder. Um, you don't see those as much anymore. I know like might be like a go-kart brake kind of works this way, at least the old timey ones. A uh, stagecoach works this way. Um, surely you're not going to design for a stagecoach. Um, who knows? Uh, then you get the um, disc brake style where there's clamping. This one's pretty straightforward to do. Um, and then the clutches, uh, the more disc clutches do a similar type thing to that disc brake. Um, there are some things to consider as far as temperature rise because the friction that you're generating uh, is going to create a lot of temperature. And these brakes, not so much on the um, drum brakes, but like you can certainly see on, on a high performance machine, um, the uh, these will glow, <laughs> you know, glow red um, when you're on a high performance car, uh, and you can kind of see there's vent holes in here to try and uh, get some airflow. You can kind of see these little fins that push air out uh, and go into uh, cooling the system. Um, there was a question, when am I doing the, the second part? I'm not actually doing the second part of this one. Um, this is the, actually the last lecture in this whole series. So um, I don't know if I'll ever go. Sometimes I do have time to get to the, the second part of this. Um, um, as far as the exam goes, though, so if you're taking the exam, then you don't have to do anything beyond the drum breaks. Um, and even the drum break parts uh, are going to be kind of pared down because it can be lengthy um, and tedious to go through and, and integrate everything, you know, if you're doing that by hand. Um, so it's a little bit harder to do. Um, I don't know that I'll get time to do the next part, like the clutches and all that. Sometimes I do. In fact, I probably have a lecture that's posted about the, the clutches. I'll have to check and see if I actually have one already done. Um, I don't remember if I did or not. I know I've done them in the past. I just don't know if I've done them as a YouTube video. All right, um, I will see you guys. Well, actually, I won't see unless you watch in the summer. In the summer, I'm doing 3D printing, so in, in basic statics, so uh, different from machine design. Um, so the beginnings of machine design, but you know, basic statics. And if you're interested in 3D printing, I've got that class going in the summer too. Um, so uh, those are the things that will be in the summer. All right, I will see you guys later. And... Let me know if you have any questions, and uh, don't forget there's an exam on Monday, and uh, I think that's about it. Oh, no, there's one more thing. Um, on Moodle, there is a um, repeat of the very first quiz, and so you do need to go and check out the uh, repeat of the first quiz uh, because it is going to count in that quiz grade. It counts like 1%, but still it counts. All right, see you all later.